the first customer for our software was New York City. Um, you know, and uh, you know, New York City, the Department of Social Services, HRA, there is is probably in the top five um, uh, social security agencies in the world, social service agencies in the world by size. The Architects of Business with EY Entrepreneur of the Year, telling the inspirational stories behind Ireland's most successful entrepreneurs. Hello and welcome to The Architects of Business, made in partnership with EY Entrepreneur of the Year, where you will hear the inspirational stories of some of Ireland's most successful entrepreneurs. I'm Sonia Lennon, recording remotely from my home at this time. And on this week's show, I speak with Graeme Stubbs, the co-founder of Diona, a company who is changing the way that people engage with healthcare and social care professionals. He talks to me about how his own personal family experience created the mission for this company and landing New York City as a first big client. If you haven't already done so, subscribe to get brand new shows directly into your feed. Graeme Stubbs of Diona, thank you so much for taking the time to be here with me on Architects of Business today. I love your story. I love your the evolution of your purpose, if you like, because it is really grounded in um, in your own story, in your own life and in meeting a very real need. And we will come to this a little bit later. I also love the idea of a business that can sell itself through the savings it makes to its clients. That's just a beautiful thing to me. But let's let's not start at the end. Let's start okay. at the beginning and talk sure. a little bit about um, your career journey, which is very much interwoven with your personal journey. Um, sure. And I think it's probably you, you, you studied in tw- Trinity, but I think things really flipped when you had a key moment and, uh, and a lucky win in the lottery. <laughs> a lucky win in the lottery. Yeah, not financial lottery, but uh, maybe visa lottery. Yeah, yeah. So, um, yeah, I, I guess, you know, how far back do you want to go? It's it's kind of been an interesting journey for me. You know, it kind of uh, I came from a very working class area of Dublin. Uh, my parents were always very hard working. Um, my dad actually set up a business himself out of need. He was made unemployed and he, you know, he always worked all his life and he kind of set up his own business in, in relation to that. Um, and, and that then, was yeah. music. Yeah, yeah. So he was he was kind of in the music business. He 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 was a warehouse manager originally for KTEL, if you remember KTEL Records and all that kind of good stuff. And unfortunately, he was made redundant in the 80s. And the 80s were you know, a challenging time in Ireland for all sorts of reasons. And, um, you know, that kind of came upon the family. My dad had always worked. He'd never been unemployed. So a bit of a shock. Um, and he just kind of picked himself up and uh, kind of said, well, to hell with this, I'm going to do my own thing. And so, yeah, he set up his own kind of music business focused very much on, say, uh, you know, indigenous, traditional Irish music and video and DVDs. And, um, yeah, he was quite successful with that and uh, became quite well respected within the industry because of it. So, um, yeah, so I guess, you know, that that's kind of, you know, my my background to my, my mom do you do you remember being sort of um i suppose emotionally engaged with that process because it's quite traumatic to think oh, that sure. you know in the, at that time your your main provider loses their stability yeah I, no I, uh, for sure like you know those kind of memories are quite vivid at the time you know interesting enough like you know my dad always had a very strong work ethic so we always worked you know i worked all the way since i was 13 so my first job was caddying at a golf course near where we lived. Um, the, you know, so we always worked. He always instilled that kind of sense of, you know, work ethic, um, worked all the way through college. But yeah, when that, when that happened, uh, you know, absolutely. It was, um, it was, it was kind of a shock to the system like it would be for any family. And it was interesting at the time, like, you know, we, we, we used to slag our parents afterwards, but uh, you know, at that time, we ended up kind of being the, the kids that were contributing to the family at the time. So we had part-time jobs. So we would hand up like Amazing. 50% of our income for the week just to kind of get by. Like I do kind of remember those those stories and I used to slag my parents that, you know, you know, 14 year old, 15 year old paying rent. <laughs> you know, but um, but it is when you, when you values think, in you, you know. 
It does. And I suppose it, um, it, it very early on makes you face up to the fear of what's the worst that could happen. Um, yeah, I, I guess, you know, thinking back now, I don't think that kind of enters into your mindset at the time, but certainly on reflection, you could, you could kind of think through that, you know, and, and kind of view, view, view it that way. Um, certainly at the time. I guess, I guess my of, point, Graham, uh, right. sorry, I guess my point, Graham, is that um, one of the things I think that holds people back from um, an entrepreneurial journey, if you like, is, is that fear. Um, and, and when you kind of know you've been low and you've got through it and come out the other side, as I'm sure, as yeah. the story of your business unfolds, there have to have been low points where, sure, you know, yeah. you thought we're out of here. Yeah, but yeah, anyway, yeah, yeah. back to the green card. Yeah, um, no, yeah, and you yeah, found no. yourself. Yeah. So finished States. Trinity, you know, ended up in Trinity kind of by sheer accident. I, I guess I was always a good academic student at secondary school. But, um, ended up at Trinity by, by sheer luck on one level uh but yeah finished the degree came out of college you know this is pre-celtic tiger myself and my girlfriend at the time who's sheila who's now my wife um you know we were both sitting around i think 1992 93 um you know pre-celtic tiger there wasn't very many jobs in ireland at the time either um and just we both applied for a green card uh through the donnelly visa program we both got them and we were sitting in her garden one evening and we said why not let's go and so um yeah we just kind of off we went uh, and landed in san francisco of all places and uh yeah kind of um kind of the story kind of started there i think um you know my background was economics i'd done you know an economics degree at trinity uh, ess it was called at the time um landed in san francisco had no idea about tech you know, remember these were the days when we were still handwriting essays for college, you know, at, at college and, uh, you know, so email was... We still make our children handwrite essays but, in school. You know, okay, fair <laughs> enough. <laughs> but, <laughs> but in those days, like email, did, you know, I would never have used email. You know, first time I ever yeah. saw an email client was, was 1993, 94 when I moved to the States. You know, that's kind of... And so was that a massive culture now. shock for you? It was... I, it so certainly when we moved, first moved to San Francisco, um, it, it, moving to the U.S. when I'd never been to the U.S. before was definitely a culture shock. I was um, in the Bay Area at the time. I was always, always say, astounded by the nature of how people in the U.S. just got on with things. And, you know, it kind of it's a cliche, the land of opportunity, but kind of really was. I always have the story about you know, there'd be 10 doors of opportunity available. And if you were willing to walk through one of them, you were going to be okay. Um, and certainly Irish people at the time, you know, we, we fell very quickly into the local Irish community um, out there. We, we were put up by an Irish guy for a couple of weeks who, was, who, who ended up being one of my best friends and investor in the business today. And he was a complete stranger to me at the time. Um, but we became very good It sounds friends. like that house was, was quite iconic. It was like uh, the guy, Neil Scannell from uh, Tarbert in County Kerry. He's a, he's a doctor. He still lives in Florida. But at that time, if, if you were Irish coming to San Francisco, you, you could nearly guarantee you knew Neil or was staying in his house. We, we nicknamed his house Ellis Island. Um, Brilliant. Because that's kind of what it was like. Um, and he was very kind to people um, and gave them a lot of time and, and hooked them up with job opportunities and everything. He was very very interested in um, helping Irish people kind of get on and get, get set up. So um, yeah, he was certainly a big influence on my life, uh, certainly then. And he put me in contact with, with a, another very good friend of mine to this day who ended up being a great friend and an, and an investor in the business. But that guy gave there's me a, my there's first- There's a team, there's a team there, there, here, Graham. <laughs> there's, a, there's a little bit of a team, uh, possibly. Um, <laughs> But Paul, Paul Joyce, he got me my first ever job um, in the tech business, uh, working at Hewlett Packard, working on a project that he was working on at Hewlett Packard down in Palo Alto. And uh, my first job in the tech business was uh, we, I was wheeling sandwiches and coffees around for the engineers who were who were on the project. And uh, I got stopped by one of the project managers who worked for EDS, which is a big big tech company at the time. Um, you know, 
asking me, talking to me about you know my background, thinking I was too smart to be wheeling sandwiches and coffees around, but I had to explain to him that the rent needed to be paid. <laughs> and so, uh, like the fundamentals, friend, the fundamentals had to be covered. And so, uh, I think he just, I, I think that rich, rich lady was his name. I think he was just astounded by how someone who had a degree from Trinity would be willing to wheel sandwiches around when he was used to all these other college students who they would hire, you know, having certain expectations about what they would do and not do. So I think he thought it was very refreshing that uh, someone would, would have a different perspective. So um, Because this was this was the boom, the beginning of the this, boom time in, this in was, the this dot-com was, boom. Yeah, this was just as the dot-com boom was kicking off. So so basically he he asked me whether I'd be interested in, say, uh, you know, getting on their graduate trainee program. Obviously, you know, I wasn't going to turn down that kind of an opportunity. So I, I, I got that. Um, I ended up being sent to Plano, Texas for six months of programming boot camp. And then I was sent to a couple of projects in, um, in Detroit, working on General Motors, doing some kind of coding project work. So, so getting my grounding, I guess, and first, the first probably career experience in the U.S., you know, it probably stood to me. And my wife at the time as well, like she did very well. She, she had a job in, in Ireland, working for Bank of Ireland at the time, and she left that to go work in the States and she started on the reception. Well, I'd say her parents were wringing their hands that she left a good job in the bank at that time. <laughs> <laughs> uh, if you knew Sheila's parents, you, you would know that, that they, they, have a very, they had a very different view on what's important in life and uh, i guess that's good. what we loved about sheila and her family um good but um the um no so they were very supportive then she she looked like everyone else like every you know she started at the bottom of you know kind of receptionist at one of the key say um um you know financial services companies over there that was you know that they focused on doing ipos she she ended up kind of starting on reception, but working her way up into the trading floor and, you know, investment banking and stuff like that. So, you know, she did quite well herself. So Brilliant. it was a good time, good time for both of us. And, um, you know, we, we, we'd known each other since we were 19. And so then, then it became a decision are we getting married or not? And we did. So, uh, so we decided to get married in 1997. And then, yeah, back to kind of the world where I didn't have it today. I guess our world was turned upside down in 1999 when our son Owen was born. So kind of that, that was really the catalyst for the journey I am now on, on one level. And Owen was born in, um, in the States? Yeah, Owen was born in San Francisco, yeah. Yeah, born 7th of May, 1999. And, and his, um, his arrival was a pretty dramatic one, I gather. Yeah, so very, so very quickly uh, we knew something was wrong. Um, you know, so... When he was born, pretty much within a couple of weeks, he was kind of given six months to live. Um, so, you know, it, you know, very rare genetic kind of disorder it's called a mitochondrial disorder, uh, which effectively means he can't turn food into energy. So 24 by 7 care, it's like, um, you know, severe development, developmental delay, severe physical, you know, kind of uh, challenges. So of course, 24 by 7 care, you know, we, we have to feed him, clothe him, all that kind of good stuff. Uh, which my wife is a saint about, to be honest with you. So, and, um, and I suppose that 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 child who was given six months to live is now yeah. twenty one. So he yes. shows the tenacity and the unknockdown ability <laughs> of his forebears. Um, uh, uh, absolutely, and you know, it's like that whole thing. Sometimes the doctors can be proved wrong. It's like, um, but yeah, um, you know, he came through that, and uh, yeah, he's still with us today, and. Uh, you know, I'd like to think that he's had a positive impact on everyone he's ever come in contact with because he's just a beautiful child. And uh, I think if you asked anyone in his life, they would say their lives are better because they know him. Um, you know, certainly, certainly he, he grounds a lot of his cousins and, you know, growing up, they, they, they take care of him and look after him and uh, they get a grounding in some of the things that are really important in life. So, so he's been a very positive influence on people. He's also the reason that you moved back to Ireland with this yes. um, slew of experience um, yes. in in big big tech and startup tech, yes. and uh, he's also uh, the reason that Diona began. We are going to take a quick break. 
Okay. Um, and we're going to come back and talk about uh, the, the, the pretty important next phase of your career. Thanks, Graham. No problem. So, Graham, you find yourself in, um, you know, a pretty difficult situation. You're back from the States um, with uh, your new son who needs care. What happens next? You, you're, you're, you're back into an environment that's very different from Silicon Valley. Oh, yeah. And it probably took me a while to adjust to it as well, to be honest with you. you know, it was you know, nearly a culture shock coming back to Ireland. Um, so, um, yeah, obviously, when Owen was born, we kind of decided that we needed to get back to Ireland as soon as possible. Um, just to be closer to family and friends and, and kind of get that support. Um, and uh, so we did that and uh, we got back to Ireland. Um, we, you know, kind of got settled down, the usual stuff, uh, moved into a home. Um, and obviously in parallel, you know, starting to think about careers, what are we going to do in Ireland? And then also about, um, you know, how are we going to get our own sorted in terms of his you know, access to programs, benefits, services, uh, and all that kind of good stuff. Um, so from a career-wise, career wise, I guess, at the time, we, we, we decided that, you know, Owen was going to need full-time care. So Sheila, we had decided Sheila was going to kind of be his full-time care. And so I was going to be the, the kind of the, the breadwinner, as it were. Um, and that's the kind of way we consciously kind of decided we were going to, you know, divide up the, divide up the world that we had. Yeah. And, um, I had I was I had actually kind of decided at the time I was going to get out of the technology rat race. I'd I'd had enough of the dot com boom and bust, and um, and I wanted to go do something different. And I had it in my head at the time that I was going to become a teacher. Um, so I wanted to go back and do a bit of teaching. That was my kind of goal. Um, uh, and I guess you know we started to you know, begin to get Owen set up. And I remember vividly having dinner with Sheila one night and we're talking about the challenges we were having around just getting him set up with all his different programs, services, benefits. You know, we were, you know, we were having to deal with numerous different government agencies. Um, there was really no coordination. Um, you know, we would talk to one agency about one particular thing and they would say, well, we don't deal with that. You're going to have to talk to a different agency. So we were kind of, just kind of moved around from Billy to Jack. There were thousands of pages of forms that we were being asked to fill out. You know, at that stage, Owen was getting mail. So this is a two-year-old, you know, kind of special needs kid, and he's getting mail. You know, asking him like things like, you know, can you confirm your address and just oh my things goodness. like that. And I'm like, this is just craziness. Um, but anyway, yeah, you're drowning, kind of, drowning in a sea of disconnected paperwork. Well, kind of, yeah, absolutely. And and I'm having dinner one night with with Sheila, and we were just talking about how if we're finding this challenging to to manage, you know, we're lucky. Can you imagine what this is doing to to vulnerable families and you know families that aren't not just as, as fortunate as, as as we we are, you know? So, um, you know, I started even in those days just thinking about, you know, how technology might be applied to kind of solving some of those challenges. And literally within two weeks of me having that chat over dinner with, with Sheila, I got called by a recruiter, you know, talking to me about this small little Irish software company based in Dublin that was, uh, you know, developing case management and uh, eligibility systems for the global social security social services market. Um, and would I be interested in a role with them? And, you know, just because of my own personal circumstance, I said, I definitely want to understand what they're doing. Yeah. Um, so went, went for the interview and, uh, you know, 10 years later, I was there at that company and that company was getting sold to IBM. And, um, you know, that company was built by the founders into a very successful indigenous Irish technology story. And that company was called Quorum Software. And, um, uh, yeah, as I said, that, you know, that company was sold to IBM. Um, and then at that time, then it was another career choice. What, what do I do next? I, you know, I had the option to go work for IBM, fantastic global brand. Um, but I'd always said uh, that, you know, and a couple of us within Quorum had always said that we would, you know, have a chat on an exit and uh, see what we wanted to do or whether we wanted to do something together or not. So, um, we kind of met up. We were all traveling at that t at that time. Um, my my two business partners that ended up being my business partners, John Polakowski and Neil Singaraju. 
we um, we ended up having a, a meeting in Kuala Lumpur, Malaysia, of all places. As you Canada. do. As you do. Uh, well, we just were all happened to be in the region on business for for Kurum at the time, and um, we we just sat down, you know, over the course of a weekend in Healy Max Pub in in Kuala Lumpur. And again, it is such a cliche, um, but the nucleus of the idea and the strategy behind Iona was basically um, uh, formed during those conversations at that time. And and we both we sorry the three of us decided that. Uh, our journeys hadn't finished in this space. We, we saw an opportunity for the next generation of software for the market and what the next need would be. And we basically and just, said- And just, uh, so this, this was the germ of an idea that was bubbling along in the background of Quorum based on the difficulties that you had experienced with, with trying to get own set up. Well, no, I th- well, so I think I've, we'd moved on from that. I'd moved on from that at this time. Like, you know, Quorum was, you know, was was addressing a number of those challenges um, and, and doing very well. And that very passionate, I got very passionate behind that business and what we were doing. I think really, you know, in 2011, when that business sold to IBM, it was really a choice of, do we want to continue the journey? Do we think there are other problems or new problems to be solved? And uh, we felt there was. And so certainly my journey kind of in that space or in this space hadn't finished. And we just felt that we would be better off trying to address those problems ourselves rather than going into IBM, which is a much bigger kind of global company. Um, we just felt that. So, so in um, many ways, there would have been no Diona without Quorum, that it was kind of an evolution oh, from one uh, to the other. Uh, Absolutely, there wouldn't have been, you know. So, you know, that absolutely there would no be, there wouldn't be a Diana without without Quorum Software, and, and our experience in the market, our experience in the space and the domain, you know, over that over that those number of years. Like I, I'm, I'm always convinced that um, you know entrepreneurs are a product of their experience. Like we're not genetically born with some gene that makes us an entrepreneur. Um, I think. You know, it's largely uh, based on our experiences, our personal circumstances, um, you know, and, and, and our knowledge of a particular industry or domain. Um, and that, that's kind of how, how Diana was born. I, I couldn't agree more. It's funny because I, I don't know how many um, amazing EY entrepreneur alumni I've interviewed at this stage, but that commonality comes through so strongly that it is deep sectoral knowledge yeah. Um, and an opportunity mindset. So yeah. h- how did how did you um, approach setting up Diona then, knowing what you knew of Quorum, yes. um, the, the good and the bad? Yes. Uh, were there certain things that you felt really strongly needed to be at the core of what you were building? Oh, absolutely. So there were, there were a couple of things that we, we, we decided straight off the bat. There were a couple of three key things. The first thing we wanted to stay in the market that we know so well and we're very passionate about. So whatever we were going to do, we were going to do it in this this market. Um, the second thing we were going to do is we were going to build software. So we, we were definitely going to go build, you know, enterprise level software that could actually be used and rolled out by people. That that's what we knew well. Um, and the third thing is we kind of wanted to build a different kind of culture within the organization, like improve on our experiences and the culture of what we 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 we'd seen that come before us, and uh, so culture was very important to us as well. Um, and I guess at the time, the three of us had say three key strengths, or what I would say, three legs of a stool that would require be required to build a software company. Anil was the techie; he knew how to build software and design software. JP knew how to deliver software, how to implement software, and I knew how to sell it. Um, and so, you know, three core things of a of the stool, as I said. Um, so we just needed to figure out what it was we were going to build, how are we going to sell it, and I guess the fundamental issue at the time we faced was how we were going to fund it. Because one of the things we did recognize from our experiences working in Silicon Valley, working with Quorum, building software companies, is it's a very expensive proposition because all your investment is upfront in building software and developing the software, and the revenues from that only flow through in latter years. Um, and that's just the nature of software and tech. Um, so that has to be funded somehow. And we weren't independently wealthy. You know, we, 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 we weren't significant or you know, kind of owners in the business that was sold. So, you know, we did the usual bootstrap kind of entrepreneurial thing. We remortgaged houses. We 
used savings. We we borrowed money from friends. We got family to give us initial seed money. All those usual things that that you do, and um, that's how we kind of got going. So you're you're, and I know what this feels like, but you're you're driven by this passion, um, to 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 create this even better solution, yeah. um. And you particularly, I suppose, from your own experience, um, how important was it for you to be able to deliver um, a, a sort of a, an efficient solution for people like you who had been through what you'd been yeah, through? Yeah, that, that, but that's that, that's kind of, you know, that's why I get up in the morning. Um, you know, I get up in the morning, you know, because I love what I do. I don't consider it a job nearly. Oh, it's hard work, but on one level, I don't consider it a job. Um, you know, I, it, it, you know, I, you know, I'm very passionate about what, what what I do, and and all the employees in the company are very passionate. It's that that's part of the culture. You know, um, you know, you know. I've often been asked, "What's the big challenge in your business?" Well, one of the big challenges we face is, um, you know, it, we're a tech company, and there's a lot of competition for tech talent. You know, we 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 don't necessarily can compete on the big salaries that Google and Facebook and all these guys kind of command. Um, we have to be competitive in terms of compensation on a compensation structure, but we do tend to look for employees and hire employees that 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 are passionate about what we do, um, and that's very important to us. And so, how would you define, other than passion, how would you define the culture of Diona? So it's very open, transparent. So I probably have a personal relationship with most employees. Um, of which there are how many now for our listeners just just over 80 you know globally in different countries um you know very open transparent so we encourage everyone anyone can pick up the phone or now pick up zoom and call me anyone could walk into the office you know you know i've never had my own office you know i we sit out with you know the leadership sit out with everyone else um so it's a fairly open transparent organization built on fairness and and a passion for the space so we tend to have lots of loyal you know kind of employees long term yeah and and loyal customers you know I think that comes through with our customers as well so so let's talk a little bit about your customers because Diona is a truly international company um, and we'll come back to that um in a short while so uh, when when this creation was fully formed you had um basically designed a solution for for government entities yes. to to create efficiencies for um both their their departmental structure their field and case workers and the end user yes so you know at the time one of the things that was happening in in that period as we all know is like mobile devices like tablets and mobile phones and smartphones were having a huge disruptive effect on the commercial world you know you know, people are, you know, got so used to engaging with their bank in a certain way, you know, booking holidays in a certain way, ordering a taxi in a certain way. And certainly we felt that that ultimately was going to come through in terms of how citizens engage with government agencies in, in getting access to benefits program services. And in the way that, say, field social workers and caseworkers and things like child welfare and other protective services and you know in home care in the way that they work and engage in the field and our feeling at the time was well you know if someone could go build a software solution that that allows government agencies to deploy those kinds of solutions very quickly very fast um, in a different way and allow people to engage in a different way that then that was going to be a winning strategy and most of the case management systems in the world most of the technology systems at, in, in this market weren't weren't there they're not designed to do that like systems of engagement are just very different like designing a solution for a mobile phone and you know to be used in a very kind of enterprise level way is very different than designing say a desktop application it's just it's just very different and the capabilities and are different absolutely um and i suppose that it, it is a kind of a, a cross platform efficiency that that sets you yeah. apart um and, and am I right in thinking that your your kind of breakthrough client was New York City? Yeah. So our first our first yes, our, the first customer for our software was New York City. Um, 
you know, and, uh, you know, New York City, the Department of Social Services, HRA, there is, is probably in the top five um, uh, social security agencies in the world, social service agencies in the world by size, by, you know, the number of benefits that they deliver, the amount they spend, they're, they're just huge. They, they, you know, the population of New York City is 8 million, um, 10 million maybe, but, uh, you know, they, they, they have a huge number of clients that they serve. And so they're, they're quite large. So yes, so to get New York City as our first customer for our software was a huge big win for us and a huge, say, you know, kind of flagship and flag that we could plant and talk about around the world. Um, but were there corks popped that night, Graeme? There were a few. <laughs> we we actually didn't cork any pops, any kind of any didn't do any celebrations until actually the, the solution went live. Oh, um, now that's a proper entrepreneur, <laughs> <right>. <laughs> and that's so, proper proper social impact. I mean, it that, that's that's kind of fascinating. Yeah, so winning the contract is always one thing, but uh, actually seeing the thing go live and working is another, and they're two very different things. <laughs> Um, and it was our first customer. So, you know, there, there were always going to be things like it was the first time our software was actually used in any, you know, real environment. So there were going to be possibly issues that, would problems. that we would need to fix and turn around and, and sort out fairly quickly. You know, and I think it was what General Patton talked about, you know, the you know, your first engagement with the enemy, you know, your plans change. Well, it's kind of like in software, your first live deployment brings up things that you may not have even have thought about. And so you have to kind of, be very quick to turn things and your second and your third i'm sure you know yeah, it's it's sure. like you can't sure. get married to the plan because the plan will fail and you'll have to replan so it but but now yeah and 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 so now you you are providing your service into among many others in new york city washington um Arizona is an interesting um case study because the work that you've done with them has has um uh seen them as an awarded uh, state? Yeah, yeah. So a number of our customers have won, you know, international awards, you know, New York, Arizona, uh, even, you know, some of our smaller company, or sorry, customers like the States of Guernsey have won awards with the International Social Security Agency. So uh, yeah, we're kind of very proud of that. Um, yeah, so yeah, it's, it's something that we work very hard on to deliver quality software that really makes a difference. And, um, and, and not only does it make a difference to to the people who interact with it, Graeme, but it also makes a difference to um, to to the, the coffers of of the governments that you work with. Oh, yeah. Arizona yeah. saved how much? Eighteen and a half million. So that's what they're projected to save. Yeah. So in their kind of case study that that they kind of. Uh, Released as part of the of, of of the project, yeah, they 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 projected a significant saving. Um, I think really more importantly, though, for them, you know, so yes, so, so sometimes it's about cost savings, but it's often it, it's often not necessarily about cost if you if you if you kind of think about it a different way. So if you think about say child protection, and you know, today most agencies around the world arm their social workers and their case workers with a pencil and a piece of paper. And they go out and engage in a very paper-based driven process. Um, and then they spend, you know, up to 80% of their time doing data entry. Whereas most social workers, case workers want to be spending 80% of their time with families and children uh, and people to, to kind of help them. And so really what, what our software is designed in terms of that use case is really to digitize that engagement process between the caseworker and the social worker um, in that moment of need when they're engaging um, and do it in a way where they don't actually end up having to redo or retype or do any more data entry and, and modern so devices. There's a, I presume at that stage there's also a connectivity between the information in each department so because it's digitized. But yes, exactly. And, and then, then there's options for making more informed decisions based on better quality data and more real-time data. Um, so yeah, absolutely. Um, but it, it's also about giving, giving the, the caseworkers access to the up-to-date information in the moment of need when they need it, when they're making critical decisions, um, you know, when they're making critical decisions about very important things like, you know, you know kind of abuse and neglect allegations or, or you, know, you know, helping families kind of improve 
you know how they you know how they work and how they kind of manage the challenging situations they face themselves with you know so um so yeah so it's about providing the tools to those caseworkers and that that use case that that really improves the productivity so oftentimes it's not really about cost but it is about say doing efficiency more and productivity and efficiency. Yeah. yeah exactly so given given you know your sector and where yes. you're working covid must have created um both challenges and opportunities for you as a business absolutely for sure yeah um so um certainly in challenges i think i mentioned earlier on you know just just you know we're, we're we were geared up or we are geared up we, we built our business very lean and in the cloud um so we manage our business our internal business in the cloud so you know having our staff work remote is just second nature to us so you know having virtual teams is just second nature to us we we, we work across nine different countries so that that's 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 normal for us um not necessarily normal for our customers. You know, most of our customers tended to have on-site teams. Um, so I think, you know, our customers showed a lot of flexibility in terms of very quickly, you know, putting in the capability for them to allow, you know, vendors like us, you know, do the work we do for them remotely. Um, and then us getting set up to do that was kind of just, that, that's just normal for us. Um, so, but it was a challenge. It's a challenge to work with customers to help them you know, kind of pivot very quickly to do that kind of work. Um, so yeah, they're they're the challenges. Um, I think. And, and were there greater opportunities then through through your Washington um, connections? Well, so I think so. The, the, you know, Washington DC is a recent project that we've just completed, and um, you know, Washington was essentially a, a direct result of COVID nineteen. Um, so um, one of the things a lot of government agencies are trying to do around the world is, is improve their, say, say their, uh, you know, kind of online kind of capability to serve the citizens that they serve. So COVID-19 has caused a lot of government agencies a lot of challenges, particularly, you know, if you think, think about, say, um, agencies like Washington, D.C., um, where... At the same time, a lot of people are being laid off or furloughed. There's a requirement for them, those citizens, to be able to apply for benefits and services as a result of that. Yet at the same time, you know, they can no longer, you know, go out and queue up in a social welfare office to make those applications, provide the documentation. So how do you do that? And we were very fortunate of we we. You know, New York City had invested in that kind of capability with us a number of years ago. So it was through. proven. So it was proven. And so all of a sudden, an agency like, you know, in Washington, D.C. would come along and say, we kind of need to provide the same capability, but we need to do it really quickly. So, you know, literally three weeks ago, we engaged with Washington, D.C., and they went live last week. So five-week project to get them up and up, up, up and running. Literally every single resident of uh, New York, or sorry, of Washington D.C. now can apply for uh, benefits through a, a a mobile solution that that's on their phone. They'll have the ability to receive push notifications. They'll know the status. They'll be able to upload documentation in support of their benefit claims. You have absolutely been recognised through the EY network and yeah. your association with Entrepreneur of the Year. Um, what what have been the benefits that you've seen or, or what's your experience been of that? Uh, good question. Um, I, I would say two things. I, I think there's two aspects of it. I think there's EY themselves. So certainly we have gotten great benefit just from the relationship with EY and the expertise that we can call on within that organization, um, whether that be formally or informally. Um, they have a great network of partners around the world who we've engaged in for different things. Um, um, and I just think the advice that they've been able to give us in Ireland on everything from, you know, our kind of tax to, you know, kind of HR issues, you know, runs the gamut really in terms of business operations. You know, certainly that has really been beneficial to the company and it helped us. And, and then when we've had, say, kind of key strategic issues or just, you know, decisions to be made, they've been a kind of a, a, a kind of a, a voice where we can go and kind of 
talk to and get 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 a perspective. So we found that really invaluable as a, as a business. Um, then secondly, I would say um, the alumni themselves have been um, terrific. So you know, um, I've often been on the receiving end of calls asking me for advice on particular issues that people would be having. Um, but more often than not, it's me reaching out to other alumni saying, what do you think about this? Um, uh, the thing that I find fascinating, to be honest with you, is that it's great to be able to talk to people with, with experiences in different industries. So we may be in different industries, but we also all have, say, some common challenges that we face every day. And so it's, it's great to be able to come out of the bubble that I operate in and be able to talk to folks who have maybe different perspectives on things. And I've found that very, very useful. Um, and, and, you know, long may it continue. Absolutely. And there's something kind of lovely in, in you all um, knowing uh, the sort of underbelly of it as well. So it's not just all wine and roses. It's, it's, no. it's that respected honesty that you, you know that yeah. there are tough times as well. Yeah, no, absolutely. And I think it, it's interesting, you know, it's it, it, the thing I found with the alumni um, is that, uh, you know, most of the successful entrepreneurs that, that, that are part of that I've talked to are, are very humble and honest in terms of, you know, where their business has come from and developed. And, and it isn't a bed of roses, it's hard work. Um, and you have ups and downs all the time. And, um, you know, what I find is when, when, when there are tough issues that I need to kind of figure through and address, um, those are the times that I reach out. You know, I, I've never had one, one alumnus contact me saying how great they were. Right. It's, all, <laughs> right? it's, it's always about these are these are some of the challenges. How, how do you approach this? You, any suggestions on how I do it? And uh, I think there's just a genuineness about the folks in the alumni around, you know, how can we help each other? And, um, you know, I, I, I didn't think when I first got engaged with it that that was going to be a kind of a, an outcome that was going to be important for me or my business. Uh, but But it has been. Amazing. Graeme Stubbs from Diona, um, I'm pretty sure that you're on route to global uh, takeover with your solutions. And I'm as somebody navigating the fair deal scheme at the moment, I'm looking forward to it arriving on our shores. Thank you so much. Perfect. And thank you for taking the time to talk to me. Thanks for listening and watching Architects of Business, made in partnership with EY Entrepreneur of the Year. Thanks to the whole team here at Joe and of course to our entrepreneur today, Rain Stubbs. If you haven't already done so, click subscribe to get brand new shows directly into your feed. 